This is a rock. There's nothing special about it, it's just an average rock. It doesn't really do much, it just sits there, like a rock. So if I were to come to you and say, this rock is a really evil rock, don't turn your back on it for a second or it'll come and get you, you would either think I was joking or absolutely crazy. And you would of course be right, because obviously there's no such thing as an evil rock. And the reasons that rocks can't be evil is that they have no awareness of what we call the moral law. They have no sense of right and wrong. And even if they did, they have no brain or strength or freedom to do anything other than sit there like a rock. And it's for these reasons that we can say that this rock is morally neutral. All the basic stuff that the world is made of is morally neutral. Wood, grass, cotton, metal, stone, vegetables, plants, earth, clouds, you name it. And pretty much everything that we can make out of that stuff is also morally neutral. Trains, musical instruments, shoes, hats, dinners, computers, footballs, plastic chairs, wooden chairs, barbecues, television sets, windows, airplanes, stuffed animals, toothpaste, and light bulbs. All of it is morally neutral. Now it's true we sometimes call these things good or bad, but we don't mean that in a moral sense. We can say a hat is a bad hat, but all we mean is it doesn't suit our purpose, or we don't think it's fashionable, or it isn't made very well. When we say a hat is a bad hat, what we don't mean is that we suspect it could lie or steal or murder us at any given moment. For something to be considered good or evil in a moral sense, it must have two things. It must have a conscious awareness of what right and wrong is, in other words, it must know the moral law, and two, it must have the free will to break the moral law. If something lacks either or both of these, it has no moral responsibility whatsoever. We innately know this is true. Say someone throws a rock at you and hits you on the back of the head. Would you blame the rock for the injury or would you blame the person who threw it? Of course you blame the person who threw it, but why? because they were the ones who, one, knew about the moral law, and who, two, chose to break it. The rock didn't know it was being thrown, it didn't know whether that was a good or bad thing, it had no part in the decision to be thrown, no strength to resist being thrown, and no freedom to do anything other than be thrown. Therefore, it has no moral responsibility. The human being is the moral agent. We can represent the whole thing using this diagram. The human being, as the moral agent, has the ability to take the morally neutral things that would fill up the left-hand side of the diagram, things like rocks and vegetables and chairs and bottles, and make decisions on whether to use them for good or for evil. All neutral objects can be used for good or evil by moral agents in this way. For example, clothes are made from morally neutral fabric. There's nothing good or evil about cotton or polyester. But that fabric can be turned into warm blankets for homeless people, which is good, or it can be designed or worn in such a way to incite lust, which is bad. Jumbo jets are morally neutral and can be used to ferry organ donations to hospitals, which is good, or they can be flown into buildings causing death and destruction, which is bad. Morally neutral musical instruments can be used to worship God, which is good, or Satan, which is bad. Even things that people would typically associate with evil actions like guns and knives are morally neutral. We can use knives to cut up food to feed a child, which is good, or to stab people, which is bad. And as the phrase goes, guns don't kill people, people kill people. The moral responsibility is always with the human beings creating or using the items, the one who is capable of choosing between the moral options, not the items themselves. The items themselves are neutral and can be easily manipulated for good or bad purposes. They're morally bendy, malleable, adaptable, flexible or soft. Neutral items can be shaped by us in any way we want and used for any purpose we want. Now let me go a little deeper on this and say that as well as being moral agents, we are also spiritual agents. What does that mean? Basically just that we are more than a bag of bones and tissue. The human being is made up of three parts, body, soul and spirit. The body is your blood, tissue and bone. It is basically a perishable container for the real you. The real you is what's inside and it's made up of your soul and spirit. The soul is your mind, your will and emotions. It's the part of you that makes decisions, including moral ones. The spirit is the part of you that contains your conscience and what some might call your intuition. It's your real centre and it's the part of you that is capable of communing with God. The Bible refers to the soul and spirit collectively as the heart of a person. 
Now this diagram is crude, but I hope you'll get its meaning. The body merely houses you, but it is not you. Now, ideally, the spirit right at the core of a person's being with its healthy conscience and connection with God should be controlling the soul throughout the decision-making process and then, having made good moral decisions, that in turn controls how they act externally with their body. Like dropping a stone into a pond, there's a ripple effect that starts at the core of your being and works its way outwards, ultimately expressing itself in your words and deeds. Your spirit affects your thoughts, which affects your actions. That's basically the chain reaction. A healthy internal spirit and conscience leads to healthy external behavior. Indeed, it's even been said that who a person is on the inside begins to reveal itself on their face. Now, taking this principle and working in reverse, if we find people using their body for immoral purposes, what we are witnessing is merely external evidence of inner corruption or impairment in the soul and spirit. How does the soul and spirit, the heart of a person, become corrupted, or nourished for that matter? Simply by what we absorb, meditate upon, and worship. Jesus talked about the eye being a lamp to the soul. Our ears work in a similar way. If we want to nurture our hearts, we have to be intentional in focusing on things that will shine light on them. That means things that are pure, noble, true, good, honourable and admirable. Similarly, if we intend to corrupt our hearts and numb our senses to evil, we simply have to absorb violence, corruption, lies, foul speech, etc. and it will have the desired effect. We become what we meditate on, worship, absorb and believe. Unfortunately, because of the fallen nature of the world, we are more likely to absorb things that corrupt us through everyday experiences. It's difficult to walk down the street without hearing foul speech or seeing an overtly sexual billboard, and it's difficult to turn on the TV without being bombarded with unsavoury themes. Therefore, it behooves us to be intentional and deliberate in choosing what we spend our time doing. We have to make a conscious effort to feed on things that will nourish our souls. The Bible implores us, saying, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Protect and nourish your souls and spirits, and it will lead to healthy external actions. For Christians, that means making an effort to get into the Word of God, to pray, to choose fortifying entertainment, and to spend time with people that will encourage us in these matters. In that way, we will stay healthy in soul and spirit, healthy at heart. I should go one step further and explain that when a person has been involved in occult spiritual activity or has not been born again or has been especially damaged internally, perhaps through neglect, abuse or rejection, there is a very real threat from demonic interference. Demons are capable of exerting a certain amount of influence over the mind and emotions of an individual and this expresses itself in the form of deep behavioural problems. Obviously, it is useless to attempt to cure internal damage in the spirit by tending only to the external body, yet this is often what happens in a secular context. The secular medical solution to such behavioural problems today is often just to pump the patient's body full of drugs. While this may subdue the external bodily symptoms, it leaves the underlying spiritual root unhealed. The mental and emotional turmoil remains inside because the tormenting demons are never expelled. In such cases, the church should really be able to step in with the solution, offering insight and internal healing to the afflicted and the broken. Unfortunately, though, Christians too have been affected by the post-enlightenment mindset of our age that says everything can be explained and dealt with by material and scientific solutions alone. So you will in fact find few churches today casting out demons like Jesus and the first century apostles. That's not to say such ministries don't exist at all, but in my experience they are rare. Yet, if there's anything Christians should know well, it's that because we are essentially spirit, we are capable of affecting and being affected by things in the spiritual realm, both good and evil. Things that our bodies can't see, feel, touch, taste or hear. When we pray and worship, we are to do such things in the spirit, in the full knowledge that such activities have a very real impact on things both seen and unseen. That isn't just a platitude, it's a fact. We should also not be ignorant of the fact that we have a very real spiritual enemy who looks to steal, kill and destroy, and that a spiritual war rages all around us, and that what happens in the spiritual realm eventually works itself out into the physical realm. 
This is the first key point then. If you want to heal external behavior, you must heal internal hearts. You must go to the roots.